morning. All right, Chris, can you bump me down just a little bit, sir? Thank you. All right, go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to be in the book of Acts this morning. Um, obviously, we just got past Christmas, and now we're heading into New Year, and it'll be a time that a lot of people will do two things. They'll reflect on this past year, and they'll look forward to the resolutions that they're going to make, the things that they want to change in the next year. Um, I don't really think about personal things too much. I don't think about, I've never been one to say, all right, well, this year I'm going to lose weight, or this year I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that differently. But it is nice to reflect. But what I do find is, and what I find myself is, what do I want to take place through our congregation this coming year? What do I want us to be known for? What are things that we can do better or what are things that we can keep doing? And really, it's real simple in my mind is what I want us to be known for is really basically two things. I want us to be known for a people that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want us to be known for a people that love other people. Those are the two things that I want us to be known for. That if, if nothing else, yeah, we're ne- we may never be known for, the, for those that redefine what church is, but I don't, I don't feel that we need to redefine that. Um, we may never be known for, well, though that church over there, man, they're, they're really alive because as we study in the book of Revelation, the, a church can have the appearance of being alive, but they can be dead. All I'm, I'm not worried about what everybody out there says. I'm worried about what Jesus says about us. And, and what we really need to do is we really need to do two things. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and love others. Those things go hand in hand because the gospel is not judgmental. The gospel is not condemning. The gospel is life-giving. It's life-transforming and it sets us free. So if you're with me in the book of Acts, we're in chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 4 through 11. So Jesus has already gone to the cross. He's already, he's already paid the price to redeem man. And he, and he rose from the dead and he spent time with everybody. And there have been several people, several eyewitnesses that have encountered the resurrection of the Christ. And so here it is, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, and into the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and the cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye, men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Would you bow your heads with me for a word of prayer? Lord, we come to you this morning and we are asking for your help. We are asking, Father, that we wouldn't just be content in coming in here this morning and leaving the same way that we came in, Father. We want you to challenge us. We want you to rend the heavens and dwell among us, Father. We want you to completely change our lives. You have promised to make us a new creation, Father, and I know that your promises are good. And I know that your promises are sure. And Father, we're asking that we would be different, that something would be changed, that we would go out and proclaim the gospel message, and we would love and and, and we would show the hurting your mercy and your grace, Father, because after all, you showed it to us when we did not deserve it. We We deserve hell. 
We deserve eternal punishment, Father. I get it. What I don't get is your grace and your mercy and how your mercies are new every morning, Father. Help us to love like that. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we're looking, and Jesus is obviously ascending into heaven. And now I, I'm sure that many of you probably could have, uh, would be, in the, be guilty of saying this because I would. Man, it would be awesome to have walked with Jesus while he walked on the earth. Man, it would have been, it would have been awesome that, that if we would have been able to see some things that the Old Testament saints saw. It would have been awesome to be able to be there and be a part of that. But yet, Jesus tells them that it's good if I go. Because if I'm here, the Comforter can't come. And what, you, what you, we don't realize is something that we have that the Old Testament saints never have is we actually have the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Jesus said he had to go so the comforter could come. And while it would be, it would have been awesome to be able to walk with Jesus and see the things that he, that he, that he did and see the, the people that he healed and been able to sit there and talk with him and, and break bread that's coming eventually, amen? amen? But you actually have, at that point in time, in his ministry, he was just in one place at one time. When he was having a conversation with a person, it was just with that one person. But if you are a believer, if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that was the power that, that made Jesus rise from the dead dwells within you. And if we could read the Scriptures and we could say that we believe that that's true, but our lives, we don't walk that out often enough. Because we find ourselves feeling defeated by the world. We can, we can post on Facebook and we can quote, quote Scripture, greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. Then why do we walk as though we're afraid of the world? We should not be afraid of the world. I don't care what laws they pass. I don't care if persecution comes because God is either sovereign or He's not. And if He's not sovereign, then He's a liar. And we can't trust anything that He's ever told us. But if He is, then it doesn't matter what they do. They can't kill us. Oh yeah, they can, they can take this physical body and they can, they, they can kill it for a while. But why do we think that Paul claims to, Paul claims, man, it's better for me if I die. It's better if they go ahead and kill me because I'm just going to go be with Jesus. How do you threaten people like that? How do you threaten people or how do you back down people that really realize that, you know what, I am an ambassador for a kingdom that is to come and I love being a part of this country and I'm proud and I'm so grateful that I was born in this country, but this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. And so here they are and they're still thinking about it and they ask, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? To Israel, they're still thinking immediately. That was the whole problem. That's why, that's why the nation of Israel rejected Jesus as their Messiah is because they were looking at the oppression right now by the Roman Empire. They were looking at Jesus. They were looking for a Messiah that was going to come in and reign on the throne. But you know what? The promise of the Messiah said that he will come. He will reign on the throne and his kingdom will go on forever. He was dealing with the forever, with the eternity, not with the right now. It's hard for us sometimes because we want him to deal with the right now and we'll worry about forever later. It's been, it's been said, and I love this, when, it, when describing, and I believe it was James McDonald, when he, was, when he describes the love of God, he says, the love of God is not a pampering love. It's not one that puts you in a bubble so you don't get hurt, so you don't stub your toe. It's not a pampering love. But the love of God is a perfect, perfecting love. He'll let you go through the fire sometimes. He'll let you go through things because it's all about drawing you closer to Him. It's all about pruning you so you can produce fruit. 
So we've got to ask ourselves as, as the next generation is coming up and, and we've got to look at this and what will we be known for? Will we be known as a generation of Jesus waiters? Will we be known as a generation that we just kept to ourselves? We came in our little building and we just kind of blocked the world out and we didn't, you know, we didn't, we didn't even set in different places. We came the same place every single week. I'm not against you if you sit in the same place. I do the same thing. That's okay. That's not the point. But the fact of the matter is, when we get up out of those seats, what are we doing? Are you walking into every single day and are you destroying hell for a living? That's what we're called to do. We're called to go out. And we have too many Christians that run around that are afraid that the devil's going to get me. I'm not afraid that the devil's going to get me. Not because I'm anything great, but I know who I am and I know who I belong to. And if you know who you belong to, then there's nothing that should get in your way and nothing should scare you. Because if you can wrap your head around and if you can believe in the God of Genesis 1, everything else is child's play. I don't want to be a generation of Jesus waiters. I don't, it's become very popular that the church just gathers together to wait on Jesus. Well, you know what? We saw all those rapture movies. I read Left Behind. I know it's all coming anyway. It's not here. At least we better hope it's not already happened. Well, there's nothing we can do. There is something that we can do because we were instructed to occupy until he comes. He has not come yet. We're supposed to occupy. Well, you know what? It could be any day now. But really, should our motivation is Jesus could come any day now, so we're just going to sit here and wait on him? Or should that be motivation? Man, we've got to go and we've got to tell people about this. We got to tell people about it because they have one of two choices. They can either, we sing that song, bow the knee. Everybody's going to bow the knee. It just comes to the fact, are you going to choose or is it going to be chosen for you? And when it's chosen for you, it's too late. Because He is Lord. I, I have never liked the phrase, and I get it, I've, but I've never liked the phrase, make Jesus Lord. You don't make Him Lord. He's already that. You either recognize it or you don't, but it doesn't take the power away from Him. He is God, whether you choose to acknowledge Him or not. And all of this garbage of there's multiple truths and multiple paths to God, that is all garbage, and it will all fade away. Because Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say, I'm a way, as long as you're sincere and you're going another path. He said, I am the way. There is no other way. Jesus is the truth. That means everything else that is not Jesus Christ is a lie. The enemy doesn't care if you believe in Buddha. The enemy doesn't care if you believe in some messed up version of God. He's okay with that. He's just got to keep you from the way. He's just got to keep you from the truth. And he says he is the life. Without Jesus Christ, I don't know what you're doing, but you're not living. You think you are. You think, well, I don't want to become a Christian because if I become a Christian, there's all of these rules and all of these things that I can't do. And you know what? I'm going to take some responsibility here that the church has become for generations about the things that we're against. You go and you can hear about, well, we're against homosexuality. We're against premarital sex. We're against drinking. We're against all of these other things. And I'm saying, and I'm not saying we can't be against those things, but sometimes we forget to tell the world what we're for why, and why we're for those things. We're for a traditional marriage. You know why? Because when it, when it, when it is established under a covenant under God, it's a beautiful thing. You say, well, what about all of the divorce? That's because we mess it up. But in, in God's form, it's pure. It's great. It's awesome. And we have, we have made it as though we hate homosexuals because it's icky. Amen. <laughs> we don't hate that sin because it's icky. We hate it because there's somebody that's lost and they're trying to find themselves and they're looking in the wrong place. They're trying to fill a void. 
I don't care. Put me in a whole room of homosexuals. I don't care. I'm not afraid of what they have getting on me. What I want is what I have to get all over them. The love of Jesus Christ and to show them you can be set free from this just the same way I was set free from all of my mess, from all of my garbage. That needs to be what we need to be about. We're preaching the gospel message, not because we're condemning the world. Jesus says in the book of John that the world's already condemned. They don't need you to do it. We, they need answers. We need to show them the way, show them the truth, show them the life. What if they don't receive it? That's not up to us. You have never and you will never save anyone. You don't have the ability. You can just proclaim the message. Are we going to just wait on Jesus? And much like the disciples, we want everything to happen right now. Well, we, we, we changed some things, we're doing some things, but our attendance is not growing. Do we want to be about our attendance growing, or do we want to be about people, showing people how they can change their entire eternity? Because, friends, if we do all this, I don't care if we don't grow, not by one other person, but there have been people in this congregation, people that are sitting here today that have been saved in here that change their eternity. If nothing else happens, we're good with it. If one person, think about it. We, we, we want the thousands and we want to put on Facebook, well, there was a thousand decisions made and oh, we're, we're going to baptize a hundred people today and that's awesome and that's great, but we forget about, man, if there's one person, think about that. If there is one person that was saved because of this ministry, that changed one soul's entire eternity that changed their entire life stop we need to stop comparing and there are ministries out there that are seeing thousands of people saved awesome that's great that might not be us that's okay because there might be that one there might be that one that they can never enter into that church of hundreds of thousands of people. There might be that one that can, that can never be able to be there or go there or to hear that message. But you know what? Maybe they could come here. And maybe they can hear the gospel message and maybe they can see the love of a people that, that we don't want anything from you. How many ministries are defined by, we just want something from you. We want you to come here, but we want you to get involved. We want your money. We want you to do this or do that. How would it look like if we just reached out and loved people without wanting anything? No hidden agenda. We're just going to present the truth and do with it what you will. Because I, I just, I believe God when he says that his word won't return to him void. I believe that he knows what he's talking about. And I do not want to sit here and just wait on Jesus. I want to be constantly in action and motion that I am running the race as hard as I possibly can until he comes. I don't want to ease into eternity. Man, I want to get there tired. Running as hard as I possibly can and getting as close to him as I possibly can. I don't want to live for the someday. I want to live for the right now. I don't want to live to waiting for the Messiah to establish his kingdom and immediately when he's working on much bigger things. We ask, God, when are you going to act? God, when is enough going to be enough? How much worse can things get and then we all get into the state of, God, just get me out of here. God, just go ahead and come back. And we look forward to him coming back. But you know what? Who's not looking forward to that? The people that haven't heard yet. The people that haven't received him. My fear is that we would want to get our close friends and family saved and then Jesus take us out of here. But I want you to notice something is when you accepted Christ as your Savior, you did not disappear. He did not take you right away. So that must mean that there's something left for you to do. We're not called to just bring the gospel message to our family, but to the ends of the earth. 
to every single person. And, you, and that person that you think about, well, they'll never, they'll never listen, they'll re never receive it. Yes, we're supposed to bring it to that person. Because if we notice Jesus' answer to them in verse 7 when they're asking about him establishing the kingdom to Israel. And he said unto them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. That was Jesus' way of saying, don't worry about it. That's not your business. Don't worry about it. And if you don't hear anything else this morning, hear this. Don't worry about it. Man, if we could just wrap our heads around the fact of not worrying about it. What about the economy? Man, even when things are going good, we're just waiting for it to get bad again. Like, man, it's, it's really, really good, but I know that tomorrow everything's just going to... Because right now, and in banking, we're going we're gonna to get a little banking knowledge going on here. We are in a rising rate environment. Most, a lot of people have never been in that before. And that, that is meaning that on, if you go to get a mortgage, you go to get a loan, the rates are much higher than what they were these last handful of years. But also, when you deposit money into the bank, whether it's in a money market account or a, or a CD or whatever the case may be, those rates are paying much better. I mean, unbelievably so, more than I've ever seen. But you're talking to people, and you're telling them, hey, you've, got, you've already have this money, because we took, we took away, and you don't, it, uh, there's no catches. You don't have to be new. It doesn't have to be new money or anything like that. But you talk to these people, and you say, hey, we can take this money that you already have here that's just sitting there. We can move it over into this account, and we can calculate it. And I'm telling you, some people, it's, it's, it's thousands of dollars in difference. But the funny thing is the way that people look at it, they're so skeptical of everything. Well, are you, well what, what if this happens? And it's always worst case scenario. Well, what if the economy tanks and everything, and everything flips upside down and all of this other stuff? And, and, and it's logical because those are the same people that woke up and overnight they had hundreds of thousands of dollars and overnight they had nothing. That's why you have people when things like that happen that, that are they're in such a place of despair that they actually take their own lives. Because their hope is in something that's here. Their treasure is in heaven where Jesus says, why are you, why are you going to store for yourself treasures here? I mean, all, all it takes is for a thief to come and take it. All it would take, and, and, and for, for though, and I'm not trying to offend anybody, but for everybody that's trying to build up ammo and trying to build up these bunkers and stuff like that, it wouldn't be that hard if the federal government wanted to take your guns away. It wouldn't be that hard for them. In fact, they've got unmanned drones that could just come in and blow it all up, and they can do it from hundreds of miles away. I don't say that to scare you or to depress you, but we've got to get past a point that, you know what, is our faith going to be in what we can store up and what we can have here and what we can look? Are we looking for something different? Are we looking to worry about the economy? Are we, are we looking to worry about the direction of our country? Are we looking to worry about our job and our career and our family's future? Or are we going to live like the song says, many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand. I've got three little girls, and I tell you guys, if I let allow myself to be, I am terrified. I'm just going to let you in here. I'm going to be real honest with you. I am terrified to think about if, if, if the Lord does tarry the things that they'll see, the things that will go on, the, the things that will go on in society because I see the differences of even when I was a child to now. And if I allow it to sink in, it terrifies me. So I can do one of two things. I can sit back and I can worry about it. Which if you, if you do a word study on the word worry, we get it from the German word virgin that means to choke. 
If I just sit here and allow myself to, to choke on the things that, well, what am I, what am I going to do if my, my kids are going to grow up in this world and I'm, I'm just going to lock them in their room. They're not going to be able to have any outside influence. They're going to they're gonna do all of these things and, and I'm going to be right there. But eventually they're going to grow up. And eventually I'm not going to be right there. So I can spend my time worrying and not changing anything or I can introduce them to the Holy Spirit that everywhere they go, He's right there. I can teach them the things that God says about them because, you know, at the end of the day, I can say all these things, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really mean anything. But when I teach them to live out and to be who God has called them to be, then I've just got to let him, I just, because there's eventually coming a time I can't do anything about it. So I've just got to give them up to God and realize, God, you love them way more than I can ever even understand to love them. And introduce them to their Savior and introduce them, the one that has called them into righteousness, introduce them to the one that is calling them from darkness into light. And I can either, and I can either be afraid to send my family out into the darkness or I can make them light. I can either be afraid to send them out against the enemy or I can tell them, you know what? Jesus has said that you are more than a conqueror. Man, sometimes I don't even know quite what that means, but it sounds awesome. More than a conqueror. We're not called to be a warrior. We're called to be a warrior. You're not called to believe the lie of the father of lies. John 8, 44 says, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of the father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He speaks lies to us. He tries to tell you. And as we look in, we look in, and there are people that pass on year after year after year. And there may be people in, this, in here this morning that are struggling that with, with, with a sin or a wrong that you committed 40, 50, 60 years ago. And you've never got past it. And the enemy's in your ear all the time saying, you know, no matter how close to God you get, hey, you know what? You still did that. Hey, you know what? I still remember that. Hey, you know what? You, you, you know how many people you hurt with that? You know how many wrongs you did? They'll never forgive you. They'll never forget what you did. And if we don't know who we are, we start to believe it. And yeah, we put, on a, we, we put on a nice picture. We put on a nice smile when we go out in public. But it, it, it hinders us and it, it builds up a wall between our relationship with a God that loves you, with a God that's on the other side and saying, break on through. Give me your shame. Give me your guilt. I paid for it. Let it go. You're not the sin that you committed. You're not your failed relationships. You're not that person. You're not the drunkenness, the drug user, the pornography watcher. That's not who you are. That is what you did. But if you step into who God says you are, He says that you're mine. And I took that on and get this. What else did He did? He transformed His righteousness to you. So when God looks at you, the enemy might be saying, you're still this, you're still this. God looks at you and says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. That's who he says that you are, and that's the only thing that matters. The enemy tries to get us to question God. He wants us to believe that we are serving a life sentence locked up by fear and anxiety. But 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. He's telling you, my love is perfect. You say, well, God, I don't, I don't think that I have enough faith. He's saying, okay, I've got enough faith for both of us. Just trust me. Because he's throwing, he's throwing the lifesaver out to you. The only part you play in it, just grab hold. Just grab hold. And as we get into the new year, 
as we get into the new year? Are we going to step into the new year with a spirit of fear? Because if you have that, it's not from God. 2 Timothy 1.7 says itself, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Are we going to step into a spirit of fear? Are we going to be afraid of the, rede- or of the rejection of men? Are we going to send there gazing at the heavens, waiting for Jesus and trying to read the book of Revelation over and over and calculate and calculate and calculate? I don't understand why there's so many commentaries on the date and time when Jesus is going to come back when he said, no, no man knows. And that's enough for me. That's enough for me. That, that's enough that, to know when you say that he's coming back then. That's, uh, that's for sure not the day. I don't know why these people make these foolish decisions that they want to put it out there. I don't need you to elaborate on when Jesus is coming back because he said that no man knows. And I'm just assuming that you're included in that. So are we going to stand here gazing or are we going to press on? We find in Philippians 3.14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God and Christ Jesus. ESV says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God and Christ Jesus. He has called us to do something. He has called us to love people, to meet them at their needs, and to show them that they are not the sin that they committed, that there is freedom in the cross of Christ, that there is salvation, that there is redemption for them. Yes, even them, it doesn't matter. Because the ground, it's level at the cross. And the same God that was able to save me and to save you is the same God that, was, that is able to save them out of anything. Out of anything. We just got to tell them. Because there are people that are dying and going to hell. And it's not okay. It's not okay. What are we going to do about it? going to tell them. Have everybody bow your heads with me. (coughs) Lord, it's easy to say. It's easy to purpose to do something, Father, but the actions we need to carry out, Father. We need your help. We can't do it. We can't do it on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are begging for you to get involved. We need you. (coughs) We pray for our pastor in the next service, Father. We pray that you would be with him, watch over him. Just help him, Father, and help us to listen. Father, help us to be challenged, Father. It's great to be encouraged. It's great to, but it it should be an encouragement to us that, Father, you have set us free and that you have given us the message so others can be set free, Father. Pray that you would just be with us. I pray that you would be with each and every one in here, Father. I pray for them, Father, for you to show them how much you love them and those that maybe may question, where are you at, at the time of need? There's no way I can know everything that everybody's going through in here this morning. But, Father, you know and you care and you love them and you want to meet them in that place and you want to just deliver them. I know that you love them more than anybody ever could. You proved it time and time again. Pray that you would just be with us in the next service, Father. Pray that if there's one that enters here and doesn't know you, Father, that today would be the day. That you, would, that you would just impress upon their heart that they need you and they wouldn't have any rest or any peace until they accept you as their Savior. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you.